diversity. We are very um, heterogeneous in our opinion. If we do not renew our partnerships with the rest of the world, Europe will not be relevant. We can make it if we are together as Europeans. Do you generally believe that countries will manage to reach these uh, very ambitious targets? Good evening. Good evening. I'm Guillaume Glossa. I'm very happy to welcome you here for this third edition of uh, the Europa Nova Political Hearings. We are lucky because we have uh, the top candidates of the European elections to debate and uh, have a conversation with uh, the public, with the participants. You can send your questions. And these questions will be taken into account by the interviewers. Europa Nova was created uh, the day after the 21st of April 2002 with the conviction that populism and uh, uh, protectionism were going to increase in the next years because we were going through a radical transformation of the words. And uh, when you have that, you have technological and scientific revolutions as well. You have a rebalancing of the policy, and it disturbs the citizens. And in that framework, it's very important to see who are the citizens who are not afraid of complex things, not afraid of chaos, leaders and politicians who can see what are the prospects for the future, and they can thereby reassure and they can feel comfortable with themselves uh, because if a leader is not comfortable with himself or herself, he or she is going to create social anxiety. So that is the mission of Europa Nova for uh, 20 years. We create a, a space where we have uh, uh, different uh, people from different parties. We have had uh, the uh, Rassemblement National. Uh, Europa Nova was very much against it. We had Valérie Ayer, and today we have Rafael Glucksmann, who's the cherry on the cake, and he's getting a lot of success recently. Europa Nova is also also wants to contribute to the public debate uh, by uh, disseminating many ideas about uh, the post-Brexit situation, uh, the Lisbon Treaty, and so on and so forth, and. Thank you. And recently, we have started, uh, uh, well, some 12 personalities, and Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, for instance, was one of those, Antonio Viterine, Agde Vieus, and other intellectuals of the continent from different political horizons have started a reflection about uh, the Europe of the future. And this led to the production of a report that is uh, titled uh, Europe 2040 Tomorrow is Decided Today, co-building a power, a global power, sustainable power and responsible power. And what we discovered through this report is that uh, what could seem as an old idea, a French idea, could become a European idea uh, with a consensus on the transformation of the Union as a power, but not in the American way or the Chinese way. Now, I have two questions to Rafael Glucksmann, and he will answer, I suppose, uh, during the conversation. So the first question is, do you really have the feeling that there is a momentum towards power? And yesterday we were surprised and Jean-Pierre said, well, uh, the speech of Draguet is uh, totally uh, in agreement with our report. And we were surprised to see that uh, the Draguet report was about uh, power. Uh, well, uh, well, the two topics were power and competitivity. But until some time ago, power was kind of a taboo in Europe. And uh, the question of, of Victor is uh, an emblematic question. I asked it to Valérie and uh, to uh, Jordan. He's my son, Victor. And he said, um, I want to go to Auschwitz with my school, and uh, but I have to prepare a letter. And I said, what are you going to include in your letter? He said, I'm going, to, I want to go because I think that it could happen again. And uh, I have the responsibility, if I want this not to happen again, to understand what happened there. And then he asked me one question, because I said I was going to meet Bartela and Aye. I didn't know yet that we were going to have Rafael Glucksmann as well. And he said, could you please ask them the question, what would they do 
to prevent this from happening again. And do they think that it's going to happen again? But I'd like to invite uh, Marion Soletti, who is uh, the director of the editorial department, uh, and she is also our partner. A very nice evening to you all. A very good evening. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank you to Europa Nova to, for welcoming us here. So I'm the editorial department director in France. 2021 is very important for Politico because it is a very dense political year with the European elections and plenty of other elections as well that we're going to follow up. And on the 9th of June, of course, we're going to uh, follow up directly the results in Brussels and uh, in the different capital cities. And we are also co-organizers of the big debate on Maastricht with representatives of the European parties. And uh, that will be on 29th of April. You can follow that online. And uh, many European channels can use that. And it is also important for us uh, in Politico in France, uh, because some time ago, we've launched a new offer of info on uh, the climate and energy transitions that are at the heart of the campaigns. We will come back to this later. We are also going to insist uh, on the digital era, the digital transformation starting this year with a, a very uh, important increase of the people working for us here in Paris. Now, some logistics elements, I think there are many people following us online, many people here in the room as well. We try to have a debate that is as interactive as possible. You can participate uh, on the social networks uh, using the at life politico or the hashtag playbook Paris election. And if you want to ask questions, and we promise that we'll try to use as many of those, you have the Slido app. For those who are in the room, you can see the QR code that you can scan. And there are already some questions there. So I'd like to invite now my colleague, Anthony Latti, who is the co-author of the Playbook Paris newsletter. I see that, I hope that you receive it every morning at seven o'clock. And Raphael Glucksmann, who is the top candidate for the uh, Socialist and Place Public Party. Good evening, is it working? Good evening, I think it's working indeed. Well, we're going to start right away with the topic at stake, uh, with uh, some uh, um, burning questions. I should have answered to the questions that were asked. So it's a very important question that was raised uh, uh, by Guillaume. First of all, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. Thank you to Europa Nova. You are pioneers in a way because uh, the topic of the European power emerged, in fact, 20 years ago. And I think that we are in a year that's going to be a triggering point because the topic of power is a question of will to be powerful, but it is more of an existential question as well. And I think that this year for all Europeans, and it is uh, President Zelensky who, at the very beginning of uh, uh, the invasion of Ukraine in front of the British Parliament, had raised this question, that is, the question of Hamlet, to be or not to be. And this question is a question that is important for Europe today. Do we want to be powerful and build a European power, or do we want to resign ourselves to be nothing? That is the question for 2024, because on the 25th of November 2024, there will be other elections, because we have the European elections uh, and for the first time with uh, a continent where there is a war, but we also have the American elections afterwards with the possible victory of Donald Trump. So if we do not have the will to build this European power, it would mean that we do not have the power to, uh, the, the, the will to exist as Europe, the power to exist as Europe. So building up the European power is not just a French dream. It is a must for the survival of Europe. And I think that we'll have the opportunity to come back to this. Now, concerning the question about Auschwitz and about the way we can make sure that it's not going to happen again. Well, when I was 15, I discovered the world through the pictures of the genocide of the Tutsis. So it was the beginning of cable TV and CNN was presenting pictures of a group of soldiers who were killing civilians in Rwanda. 
And uh, these pictures were so striking that it uh, directly plunged me into the adult world. And I saw then when I'm uh, grown up, I will work on Rwanda and the genocide. And that's what I did. There was a film that was made. I went to Rwanda and uh, we found cadavers in uh, common mass graves. And uh, so things like this can, can happen, not necessarily with the Jewish people, but these are events that can happen again. And in fact, uh, once you've opened the doors of Inferno, they're never going to be closed. And it's our duty. And in the end, it's uh, the, 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 the starting point of the European construction and we all have to take into account this possibility that worse could come back again. And we do not have to build Europe taking into account the past strategies, but the current and future tragedies. So that is the big question of the political commitment that was in fact raised by your son. Well, thank you. We'll come back to this, unfortunately, because it's part and parcel of the news. We have wars uh, on the European continent and in the rest of the world as well. But as it is the topic today, the European campaign, and Guillaume was saying earlier, you are uh, acquiring a lot of uh, importance today. You are ascending. And uh, there was a survey that mentioned the figure of 14% for you. That's the highest uh, a figure for you. And uh, uh, Jordan Bardella and Victor Raye, while well, Jordan is still around the 30%. So uh, the difference is getting smaller. So where do you see yourself in the future on the podium? Well, I promised myself one thing, i.e. never, not publicly, nor in my private life, uh, to never um, define a, an objective with figures for this campaign. The victory for me would be that people who vote for us vote in a happy way, so uh, that they were they are happy with themselves. During the last elections, uh, uh, people made different choices, and each time they had to uh, give away something of themselves. And what I want us to show is that we can be uh, very strongly attached to uh, transform it, uh, social transformation, ecological transformation, and also the European construction process and democracy. And these four pillars of our vision of the world can meet together in only one campaign, in only one world. And the dynamics we were able to create uh, that is still growing. I'm not saying that we have succeeded, that we've reached the end. So it is dynamics that's based on this process of reconciliation with ourselves. And everywhere we go, from Clermont-Ferrand to Rouen, from Nancy to Lyon, everywhere we go, we see people who feel a lot of enthusiasm. So that's already a success. And it is a success that is based on one thing. At the beginning of the campaign, many people said, you don't have to mention Europe too much because it's boring. But I do want to talk about Europe everywhere because I think that it is important uh, so if it is the European elections, we have to talk about Europe, not only the national processes. And Europe is so much at a crossing point that if we miss this election, if we do not have a debate on the European Union, on what we want to do, on the emerging power that is Europe, on the Green Deal and so on and so forth, it would be missing an opportunity we have in history. And what I think is that dynamics is also based on the fact that we give an answer to the questions raised by the citizens. You have Emmanuel Macron, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, or Marine Le Pen, but our campaign is about Europe. But what you're saying today is that things are, are not uh, um, frozen, that there, there are still many possibilities, that it is possibilities to vote on the basis of your conviction in that respect. I want us, well, there was like a, a match, pre-planned match, Le Pen and Macron, and it's the same match being played again. And uh, many people feel that they are from the pro-European left and they have the feeling like they are stuck in between two uh, powers and they cannot breathe in that universe. It's Macron, Mélenchon. Oh, Le Pen and Macron, and we've broken that up, and we are opening up the 
space, uh, uh, pushing the walls. To what extent we can go on pushing the walls, I don't know. I don't know where we're going exactly. But do you... So we're pushing the, the walls and we are breathing. It's nice to breathe, right? And it's very important for human existence. Do you, from a tactical point of view, do you consider that the difference is good enough and that there is a real match and it's uh, not a match only with the rest of the left but with the others? Well, I think there are three main options here. You have uh, the option presented by the extreme right, that is the regression that's falling into the hole, and then there is a continuity with uh, a uh, weak policy, an unfair policy, and then our option, that is the emergence of a European power, ecological, based on solidarity. And these are the three big options we offer, we have, sorry, in these elections. Now, I never considered that it was a match for the left or the right, but I think that at the same time, it's going to clarify things. As I said at the beginning, I don't think that this election is a post-presidential or pre-presidential election. It's a European election. And it is important to see what is at stake on the 9th of June. Is it going to be the Social Democrats or the EPP? Uh, and very humbly, I think that Jacques Delors' uh, spirit is not bad also. And, uh, well, the CFDT is not the same either. But in France, what I want to show is that uh, in the left electorate, the pro-European line is assumed. So it doesn't mean that we fully accept the European policies, but we trust the construction of a European political space. We have this will to invest into it and do something with it for the future of our democracies. And, uh, and I think there is a majority of people on the left side who think that. So if you have a good score for the election, so social democracy is more important than uh, uh, the movement of Mélenchon. Well, the love of democracy and the will to resist to the authoritarian regimes and the dream of a political, ecological, social Europe is something that is very much present in, on the left side, and I'm convinced of this. Otherwise, what's what's? Why would I do that? I'm fighting. I've been fighting for from the very beginning, uh, uh, since I was an adult. So I want to have this European democracy, and I'm sure that we can convince a majority of citizens who feel that they belong to the left that it is the path to be followed. And I think indeed that uh, many people who at the last elections have chosen to vote for Jean-Luc Mélenchon did it uh, in spite of the position of Europe and not thanks to that position on Europe. And therefore, I think that there is a space that we can reunify. People have made different choices at the last election, so we have to reunify this with a very clear goal. And what I do not want to do, uh, what I reject as a possibility, is to segment uh, the, the citizens. Do you want to speak more with the people who've chosen Macron or Mélenchon? I, I, I cannot have a segmentation of what I'm saying. But if we decide of uh, this goal, we can attract people who made very different choices at the last elections. Well, you do not have a goal, but others do have a goal. And some people have changed their strategy uh, towards you. I think about Renaissance and, and the team of Valérie Ayé, with the criticism and the attacks towards you. There was Jean, uh, Jean Barreau as well. Uh, so what do, you, what do you think about that? Well, what I observed is that they started a campaign saying that uh, they don't understand why I'm with them. Uh, because we vote in the same way for the same thing. So that was the kind of speech we could hear. Then on seniors, there was another kind of speech saying that I was an awful person on the left who wanted to open the space for migration and wanted to impose taxes on the rich people. So depending on your public, you change your speech. And I think that their option today is, and it's my memory uh, that is uh, that I'm counting on. So that was they were saying saying that uh, the a tree is hiding the forest. So 
Well, maybe you could say that number three on your list is Pierre Jaubray from the Socialist Party who negotiated the agreement. Well, and you will have observed and on our list, we have people who were for, others who were against. And so we managed this miracle that is the union of the Socialist Party. So there is no forest behind. No, it's not a forest. You have plenty of trees and we can consider it a forest. But anyway, there is no one, no tree hiding the rest. And what I mean with this is that we are today the target. They target me more specifically. And uh, in the Asumi, uh, they say that we are, uh, in fact, liberals, that in fact, we are from the right. And uh, from the Macron side, they are going to say that, in fact, we are from the left and we are preparing uh, the comeback of the left in the country. So I think that if we go on towards our objective, that is realistic and radical because the situation is demanding radical changes and we're going to talk about ecological topics and so we're going to see what it means when we say radical realism so in fact <coughs> we will have a dynamic campaign les autres que l'inverse donc c'est ça veut dire qu'on a confiance dans les idées qu'on porte so uh, i'm attacking less uh, the other than reverse yes indeed with uh, that uh, bureaucracy approach it's a sensitive aspect from your image uh, someone intellectual parisian rather well educated rather the upper class according to the polls well I'll come to that. I'll come to that. This is my question. And as some saying, what's really the difference? Glucksmann, it is somehow Emmanuel Macron on the left side. I'd say bureaucrat. Uh, well, we have got some questions, but I've got a mandate. And I invested all my time during my uh, mandate, uh, my soul and my body, and nobody can the uh, re uh, reproach that I didn't invest, you know, as from the first day of this mandate, I asked the creation of a special uh, commission and everybody looked at me as I, as if I were so bizarre. And that commission has been a, a core of the matter in the, uh, the, uh, in the uh, institutions and this because of Ukraine. I went into the international commission very energetically and thanks to mobilization of uh, millions of young French people to uh, fight against Uyghur uh, slavery and the, uh, against the multinationals, we opted, we got some uh, bans, bans on the products of slavery. This mandate, and it is a fantastic uh, mandate, and there has been uh, critics as a bureaucrat, I say, uh, they're pulling my leg because for 20 years I've been fighting for the general interest and for European democracies as from Georgia, Georgia uh, Ukraine until the European Parliament. So I didn't wait for some people to talk about Putin to defend the principles of Europe and this bureaucrat aspart it's certainly not mine. On the other side, every or all or, or whole approach or project it is to ensure that the uh, European policy change would provide the answer to the needs of those categories who have been a victim of trade policies, European policies because of relocation and saying things we have not been able to regulate. As a matter of fact, our campaign or political campaign, it will not happen only in the 10th uh, around, uh, area of Paris where I grew up. There, there are less upper class uh, areas as uh, today, but we're going in the farms and in the um, production units. Over there, there is a uh, perception of Europe, which is a issue and of concern. And because of policies led by Europe, which were uh, dangerous and bad policies, my message I want to carry across 
is uh, to show how Europe can protect those people, people who have been victim of bad policies for years. We were talking about Ukraine, so complicated. This morning at Politico, there has been an article of our special reporter uh, from there and witnesses from uh, people over there saying that the front might um, be dismantled because of the uh, uh, lack of support from the European countries. Would you say very quickly, would you think that the war might come to an end? Yes, I got some pieces of information confirming this view. There is such a delay of delivery of arms, such a disbalance, an, an unbalance on the front. And, and yes, we are tipping over. And for the first time, Ukrainians who had developed an optimistic communication on the situation on the front, uh, they are uh, sending alarm signals. After two years, even more than two years of war, waging war, France, which has probably the most developed uh, arms industry in Europe, is in a position only to provide um, 3,000 uh, explosives a month. And the uh, Russians do explode about 20,000 units a day, bombs. So we are not still in order regarding production. We didn't do what was necessary in allowing the uh, Ukrainian resistance to win the battle. What, what needs to be done? Because Emmanuel Macron is saying the same. What can you do in two years? Well, let's say in June, June 22, the president of the French Republic said, we have to uh, switch to a war economy. Ever since, there's been no new contract with the defense industry. So it's about the pleasure of words and the weakness of acts. And we need to step away from that as a chair of this commission of uh, fighting against the uh, uh, emission of the uh, foreign powers. It is still an idea which is anchored in the elite of Europe. The idea that it is a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. This is false. This war is not limited to the borders of Ukraine, and it didn't start on February 24th in 21. No, the Russians attack the hospital of Skorbay Essen and uh, take away the position and the possibility for doctors to act. When they target in Africa the French uh, militaries, and it's all over the place, their target is to destroy the safety architecture of Europe and to uh, annex Crimea has been totally a failure for Western uh, leaders. It was a taboo which um, broke the peace for ever since 45. And second, to destabilize the democracy. And this has been materialized on a military point of view on the uh, Ukrainian front. If you are aware of that, we need to increase drastically for support to the uh, uh, Ukrainians, not because of solidarity with that people that resist on behalf of principles we share with them, but for our own interest, it is of our own vital interest, and we don't do that. When you negotiate as much as possible at the European level, you know, it is to say the text on um, the production of munition. Well, the Commission and the Parliament do agree and align, and Paris and Berlin uh, do refuse the prioritization. Priority, it's maybe just a word, but at the, as a matter of fact, priority, it means that by refusing this, one should refuse to provide a priority to provide Ukraine with arms, and we continue with Emirates with uh, Saudi Arabia and with Qatar. And while we don't succeed in providing Ukraine with munition, we do continue as with the business as usual, that the future of Europe is not decided in Riyadh. The future of uh, Europe is to be decided at Advika. And that is something we need to understand right now. With other words, in West Europe, Western Europe, 
if not really the case in Central Europe, we missed the, uh, the February 24th, 22. And it's time to wake up, i.e. to listen to what the Commission has been asking for, as the Commission didn't miss as much as the Member States and Paris and Berlin in February 22. First, to uh, seize the uh, assets of your Russian uh, assets in the banks, to use it for a help to Ukraine, and secondly, to invest into our defense. It's 100 million, 100 billion, as suggested by uh, Thierry Breton, and to have a purchasing power in the Commission to provide Ukraine with arms. Czech Republic has been uh, insisting to push for uh, purchasing abroad. Yes, you need both. All European funds, which are under midterm uh, to be used for Europe, uh, are to be used. Uh, but we have such a problem. We have no time to increase our production units. So both are to be done simultaneously. And Czech Republic is right. Well, there are many other subjects to tackle. You do support the membership of Ukraine to the uh, Europe uh, in European Union. It is an applicant beyond the symbol. Of what what terms would you think within five years, ten years? What is the right uh, time lapse according to you? Answer: Well, it depends on the rapidity of reforms in Ukraine, but also in Europe. The only thing we can say it is not next year. It's not within two years. But would it be five years, seven years, or eight years? I can't tell you. What we want to suggest is is a agenda 2030 to prepare Europe and Ukraine for enlargement. You need to state it. You know, some play on the people are scared, uh, the uh, fear. It is a historical moment for the reunification of European continent. In the end, we get that, but also the Balkan countries and Ukraine. But it will happen only with reforms and Ukraine and reforms in Europe. For instance, agriculture, that is a concern, particularly the major production units in Ukraine. If we don't change the common agricultural policy, it will be an issue. Common agricultural policy, it is uh, subsidizing the hectares and the big, big, big um, farms in Ukraine on our markets would cause an issue to our agricultures. But anyway, we need to change this gap anyway, anyway, whatsoever. So you don't finance the uh, Ukrainian farms. If you want to ensure that uh, ecological transition, if you want to get into the income of the agriculture, during this agricultural crisis, we talked a lot about the standards and those who said to be the spokesman didn't talk about income and didn't call about the inequality of subsidies because in the cap it's about a third of the European budget. Well, 80% of these subsidies is only for the biggest firms and those who are linked to in agro industry. The cap as such, it is maintaining the breeder working uh, 60 hours is totally outside of this subsidy policy. He is not affected at all. Anyway, if we want to make a success of the Green Deal, the transition and to uh, reduce inequalities within the agricultural world, you need to review the cap to have to switch from the hectare subsidies to uh, a uh, subsidy to the ecological utility. We fought against the right wing, against extreme right within the EP. So the reform we need to proceed to, to have a integration of Ukraine, we need to do whatsoever. And the same regarding institutional uh, reform. It's not because uh, Ukraine would join us, we need to stop with unanimity. It is because anyway, uh, being 27th, this rule is stupid, inefficient, and counterproductive. And for all the reform we need to do in Europe to attract Ukraine, we need to do that even if Ukraine didn't join us. 
Yes, indeed, it's quite uh, difficult to stop this unanimity rule, but we need it, we need it. This is our political program. It is um, spread at the European level, at the level of our group, and we make an end to the rule of unanimity. Europe needs to be do, done concretely. We are too much in intergovernmental approach, and that is a permanent paralysis. So, as a matter of fact, I do think we are in a world of truth. Either you take a responsibility in terms of the building construction, or you accept to dismantle Europe. We will talk about unanimity and uh, the consequences for your program. More specifically, there is another major subject, which is the Green Deal, ecological transition, with uh, the crisis of agriculture, but about the transition, you told we need to go to another step, not only the norm and the standard, but the investment. You are insisting upon massive investment in health care and in defense, although you need to find uh, some funds. How will this be financed? You were talking about a, uh, um, uh, a tax on the wealth, which is also opposed to unanimity. So you need that uh, unanimity. So all these ideas are rather complicated in the uh, system for the time being. Let's say uh, that it's possible. Could you develop what is the length of time? How do you want to proceed? First of all, I know you need to provide short answers, but you covered so many themes in your questions. First of all, today, the right wing in Europe is fighting against these norms, against the Green Deal, against the uh, sanction uh, ecology or uh, standard ecology. We want to defend what has been done during this mandate. We won't accept the uh, Green Deal to be dismantled. We will fight in order to protect what has been acted. That means that the French government was wrong to go backwards regarding the uh, FITO uh, product. Well, they were wrong not to put the question of income instead of only talking about standards. No, they didn't talk about it. To ungreen the, the cap, but they don't touch the uh, spread of the subsidies. So I understand why some representative of some interest have no interest to put into question the spread of that subsidy. But what 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 was need to be done in the emergency? It is uh, years of work, the cap uh, restructuring. That's something we can do now. We took the green color from the cap and we get back to standards which are still not implemented. It uh, made of the Green Deal uh, the uh, culprit person, while it is not acted, it's not implemented at all. Nothing has been put into practice. We are, uh, this is totally full. I mean, the responsible of a crisis, which is so deep, uh, coming from so far, and that is something that has been voted but not been put into action. With other words, a kind of hip hypocrisy in order to have this uh, uh, legitimate uh, um, uh, the people who are uh, uh, angry, angriness. But if we were to remain to the constraining uh, targets and norms, of course there will be a revolution. What we do suggest is a massive investment, but also a industrial policy, and also to plan things at the European level so that this transition could occur by with respect on the social point of view. And we need to go to step two. So yes, indeed. But I needed to explain this, why there is such a need of investment Otherwise, we will be uh, really uh, um, uh, totally um, loose. It has been estimated that a 400 billion a year additional investment is needed for ecological transition in order to be fair and to allow industrialization of the European continent. This money is to be found. 
First of all, in terms of pandemic, uh, we have made a major step forward in building Europe, and nobody thought it would be possible before the virus, i.e. to use debts. What we did in front of this virus can be done also in the perspective of the climate issue, except that today Germany say, says no. Germany says no before the virus, the uh, pandemic. And uh, look at the proposals on the table, first defense and secondly climate. On November 5th, the election of uh, US president and Germany would uh, say yes. So there is an evolution of these positions. The crisis are so fast, so this uh, is flexible. So first, this will be a major question on the table. Secondly, it will not be sufficient. And yes, indeed, France will play and they will say uh, with uh, debts without reimbursement, we will create a new layer of behavior, which is uh, how to say it's about uh, permanent uh, debt. So we need your own uh, resources, financial means. That's a question which is at the core of our project. How do you deal? How do you ensure Europe to be able to make uh, its investments, the own resources? It is taxes, isn't it, to collect money, fundraising? Yes, it is a catastrophe. So how to deal in order to have Europe to have money, money which not come would not come from the state, member state, has not always been the case in the EU. Today, it's a contribution from the states, it gets a feeding a European uh, budget and it is redistributed. The EU must be able to have its own money, as such to tax the Europeans. Well, we have got several proposals and one of these, it is to tax the highest uh, wealth at the level of the European uh, level not uh, the uh, fishermen of an island. There was uh, something like a person uh, heritating uh, from uh, a house with a very low income. No, I'm talking about billionaires, millionaires at the European level, because all studies point out that regarding the, uh, uh, the their, their uh, inherit heritage, they pay less in uh, tax income. So it's five or the 10 richest person. Well, be reassured, be reassured. Don't, don't, don't. Uh, it's it's a four to five, it's not even one. So I'm really talking about a very, very, very rich people. And to tax their, on their income, and on, we have to work with a very known a fiscal expert, an economist of uh, Europe and the world. And he said, until, and it depends on the scale, until 200 billion a year. As a matter of fact, there is a source of financial means, but it's not the only one. And we launched another initiative shared at the European level, and uh, it has been. Uh, with Paul Magnette and with uh, others uh, we have worked upon uh, this with the European level. So in the room, if there are some who didn't sign that document, it's well, it should be done so that it can be debated in Parliament and be suggested by the Commission. Next to this, there are multimillionaires, PASF. So there are people who are ready to pay for the, the ecological transition. It's a minority. Well, I don't know. We don't know them all. Do you know them all? No. Well, we can organize a survey among those people who have millions and billions, but there are some signatories among them. They want to pay the right amount. At the same time, um, during this uh, term, without the real support of the French government, uh, but it was something um, uh, supported by our party, it was uh, taxes on uh, very high uh, benefits, very high profits, sorry. And 
So it is something that should last in time. And the result was very disappointing in France. You said in France, that's an important word, because it's one of the countries uh, that wanted to start this. Uh, and the, the transition was not very much as compared to what the Commission was proposing initially. So we have to have a better transposition of this principle and make it sure that it is permanent. And then you also have the carbon adjustment mechanism that should be extended and also other possibilities for funding that uh, because well you have to understand we have to fund the european budget uh, and uh, there is, in in ID, in france we have the idea uh, that uh, we are very rich at european level but we do not have a real budget so i'm fighting with uh, thousands of people in france in favor of this kind of mechanism we can have a coalition we can convince uh, ursula von der leyen and implement that so i'm going to go in different places in europe to see how we can implement things we can go to antwerp and other places people who are working for customs are going to feel that their work is uh, meaningful but when you arrive in Amsterdam, you understand that the business model is to let everything come in. So it, it, they are not really enthusiastic. The problem is that if you apply that, it, it, and it's not something harmonious in Europe, if there is a harbor that does not apply it, it doesn't work. So afterwards, I came back to Brussels and I said, uh, we have to make sure that this kind of implementation is indeed there. But in fact, there were only two who were in favor of that. So it's a real problem. So I'm not going to say that we need more civil servants in Europe, but uh, some people would not agree. But anyway, we give more and more tasks to Europe, and we do not have the means to make sure that things are going to be indeed implemented. So we have to take our responsibilities. If we want to have a social Europe, we need the budget. We need a redistribution system. So more civil servants would mean more money. No, it's a joke. It's a joke. So if I say vote for me, it would mean more taxes and more civil servants. But no, it's a joke. So you withdraw that proposal. But it's, it's something on life. So I cannot withdraw anything. I would like to precise that it's about the 0.005%. Well, we're going to continue because time is flying. Uh, concerning public expenses at national level for the moment, uh, there is a lot of debate because of the deficit that is more important than foreseen. And it's also very important towards the European partners. Uh, that there is some reluctance from the Netherlands and uh, the Germans. Uh, so. Uh, well, I'm making a long story short, in fact, when I'm saying this, but you support the general objective to make sure that the public expenses is sounder. Well, in fact, when you have a budget problem, I do not agree with the fact that you're going to limit the rights of the unemployed, for instance, or take money out of them. I remember Mrs. Bourne. Uh, when she was a prime minister, she said that we had to change the unemployment system because the situation was good from an economic point of view. So she said it was the moment, the right moment to change the rights of those people. And then we have prime minister, a new prime minister, who says we have to change the rights of the unemployed because the situation is bad. So when the situation is good and when the situation is bad, we have to change their rights. So it's a natural response to take the money from the unemployed. But, well, I think that we have to be very serious when you talk about the budget, but I don't think that uh, we are in bankruptcy in France. But at the same time, I don't think that the Renov premium and the rights of the unemployed are the right objective to reduce the, the expenses. And at the same time, if uh, once again, at the same time, you have a record dividends each year uh, over the CAC 40 and you have less taxes on dividends as compared to taxes on work, maybe there are other possibilities instead of attacking the unemployed. So I do not understand this kind of logic. but. I'm going to say something else. 
there is a sort of uh, opportunistic point of view for those who uh, refuse to participate to the common fund. And it's very simple. Uh, this uh, budget loan is going to be to, to, to target expenses, uh, investments that are necessary for everyone. When we talk about the defense, for instance, it's now right away that we need this kind of investments. And the Germans themselves are faced with a wall when we talk about the investments required. So, in fact, the problem is that, well, well, the, the population is supporting this, this kind of limits. Yes, there is a legal limit, in fact. So. In fact, a problem, there are some problems of investments in Germany as well. In Germany as well, that's what I wanted to say, in, independently from the French budget situation. So that's the reason why I think that those loans are going to happen, because the history is going to decide this for us, because of the crisis, and, and with that we progress in the European construction. We have the ecology, we have the security that will oblige us to invest, but at the same time, there is a, a situation in Germany that's also very interesting. And in fact, we do not have to say Germany anymore. What do you mean? Well, for instance, people say uh, German employers are in favor of uh, uh, free trade, and it's never going to change because uh, we can say s sell our added value products and then we import uh, uh, Chinese goods. It was the trade policy of Europe for a long time. It was based on this German principle. Now, today, among the German employers, uh, there are very interesting debates and very strong ones, by the way, because this kind of deal is not working anymore. Uh, the agreement uh, between uh, the Chinese and uh, the, the, the European capitalism is not working. Well, at least uh, for the SMEs in Germany, well, they are not really SMEs, they are bigger than that. And uh, in France, they would be considered as big companies. So the Mittelstand in Germany become the victim of the opening up towards the Chinese production. So on the one hand, you have big groups like Volkswagen that uh, uh, established very strong links with a, a relocation of their production in China. And uh, a, a majority of the production is in China and 50% uh, of the sales is the Chinese market. So these companies became Chinese companies, in fact. And on the other side, you have representatives of the Middle East who say, well, it's not working anymore because we are uh, suffering from this. And we are going to suffer in the same way the French people have suffered. So there will be a change of trade policy in Germany. And Germany is different from France because in France, it is the uh, political segment that decides everything. In Germany, there is a social consensus. And finally, the political arm is doing what's the result of the discussions between the industry, the social partners, and so on and so forth. So it takes more time to change. But when things change, it's huge. And I think that today Germany is uh, fractured. So that's the reason why it's an important moment in Europe. And that's the reason why we can defend solutions that are different from the past. Well, the European loan is also something that Emmanuel Macron is defending during the COVID and today with the Ukrainian war. So the president is normally going to make a speech uh, next week, uh, like it is six years ago. And the supporters of Macron said it was right before uh, the time when we talked about the defense, the European sovereignty, and so on. So uh, do you agree that it was right before the others? Well, I, I liked very much his speech at the Sorbonne six years ago. That's a scoop for you. But behind that, what I want is facts. So if he repeats the same words he gave at the Sorbonne, we can say it's a nice speech, but what happened after the speech at the Sorbonne? Why um, the Macron France blocked the directive on platform workers uh, that was defended by Nicolas Schmitz, uh, that is uh, the, the workers with a rise from Uber, uh, for instance? 
There's also the due diligence of uh, companies uh, that was evoked. Uh, well, that was not included in the Sorbonne speech. Uh, well, it was a nice speech, but what happened afterwards? Uh, why w did we miss something on the 24th of February? It's because after the speech, uh, uh, there were uh, um, things that were established, uh, and we said that we had to do, uh, do things with Russia. Uh, why do we uh, deny Vilnius and the war? So why do we consider that it is in Beijing and uh, in uh, Moscow that the European interests are? Why? Because, in fact, uh, it's the same and same thing that the French elite is repeating, that the French presidents are repeating, because when they have a specific relationship, and the president of the Republic, by the way, is going to invite someone uh, in the house of his grandmother in the Pyrenees, and that's the, uh, the, the president of Beijing, and this is going to be done without any consultation with our um, European allied. The last time it was with Ursula von der Leyen, but she was put aside because she had uh, uh, positions that were much more clever than those of Paris uh, and Berlin concerning our economies. Well, in fact, what I mean is that we have to behave as Europeans. And President Macron, who had pro-European words, did not have pro-European policies. And I think it's a problem. And I think that we have to deep analyze this. And the recovery plan and the COVID plan, well, I, I applauded the initiatives. And I think that the, the, the question of the debt is also going to be considered as being the result of his action. He had an important role. He was not the only one. But anyway, what I mean with this is that we have to understand that Europe is not going to be just Paris and the rest of Europe following Paris. So we have to build a project with the other Europeans. And this means, because, well, at the beginning of his presidency, on the first evening when he was elected as the president of the Republic, there was the European hymn. And there was the march of the Louvre. And there is a contradiction there, to my mind, because the march of the Louvre in the solitary was like uh, the monarchy in the French tradition, the man alone who takes his own decisions. And then the European hymn that is more related to the consensus, the uh, democracy, the debate, the, co the compromise. And it was a, a, a shock between those two. And we have to, to change that. And the future of France, the future of the French power, the fact that our country is still, still has a message to convey in this world and can still have a weight on things, well, this has to go through meetings in offices, in modern buildings that are not very elegant in Vilnius, in Prague, in Warsaw, much more than through visits of the Hermitage with a former KGB agent or with uh, uh, military parades on the red carpet with a Chinese butcher. So it is less focusing on the narcissistic element, but that's what we need. Well, you talk about the culture of uh, compromise, that we have to accept that other countries are not going to have necessarily the same position and that France cannot impose uh, its uh, ideas. But uh, there is uh, the migration pact. Uh, that's quite You did not vote on this, uh, but it was a result of a compromise. So you consider that it was not sufficiently based on solidarity, for instance. So why did you not vote? Because I've read the, the, the texts. Uh, and usually I vote on texts by reading them and then asking myself fundamental questions. And I had in this case two questions when reading the text. The first one, is it an answer to the concept of indignity? And when I say indignity, I mean the fact that, that uh, 50,000 human beings uh, are have died in the seas. Uh, indignity also means that human beings uh, are uh, left uh, in a legal no man's land uh, 
and are pray for the mafia and have uh, to work in a clandestine way. And it also it is also the chaos of the migration policies of Europe. The fact that um, the whole weight is on the entry points, the entry countries, because initially there was a commitment between the parliament and the commission. And yes, but the legislative uh, uh, process means that there is a compromise with the council. Yes. But we accepted so much from Victor Orban, Orban. and it means that in three years, in three years, we'll have to negotiate again because today we do not have European solidarity that would have been the counterbalance for all repressive measures that can go against our principles. The member countries have to help the entry countries. Well. Well, you have Greece and Italy, for instance. Not only other countries. Uh, solidarity means that you have to support the entry countries. Uh, well, Viktor Orban can pay for barriers uh, to be erected and consider that it is, uh, it is his participation to the European migration policy. I do not agree with that. There is, in fact, no migration policy in Europe. The people who go on board uh, those vessels, they want to go to Europe, so to Greece and Italy, but we need a European answer and we lack ambition because it's not realistic as a policy. So I've not voted for something that's not going to give an answer to the two fundamental questions. And then there is also another question that is not dealt with because it's not popular, in fact. What happens with the legal means, the legal possibilities? When we talk about migration, it's not only to be protected again against clandestine migration, the economic migration, you mean? Yes, yes, it means that you have to have the possibility to develop legal ways with multi-entry uh, visas negotiated with uh, the uh, countries of origin. And it's Europe that negotiates that. Yes, well, one question is always there. Why is it possible to make sure that those who are not entitled to an asylum status or to stay on the countries, why uh, do can isn't isn't it possible to give them the consular authorization? So what we need is a, con, a contract with the countries of origin. So when we give a visa and we need it as economies, um, migration zero means the, the death of European societies. We have to be aware of that. And so we give those visas. And in exchange for that, they have consular authorizations. And I think that it's important for those countries to do that. So it's not only a humanistic policy, it's also a realistic uh, policy. And when you see the right, all the slogans on migration zero, what does it mean, in fact? Mrs. Meloni, with uh, the uh, naval blockade, uh, saying that no one is going to enter the country. And then 420,000 workers, foreigners. Why? Not because Brussels, Brussels demanded that, but because reality is there. And Mrs. Meloni had to face that reality. So we have a problem of a hypocrisy. And the role of a politician is also to examine all these questions even if it's not always popular. But what is your opinion? You talk about the legal migration, but what about the illegal migration? Those who not have the asylum, do they have to be sent back? Well, if there are legal possibilities to enter the European territory, it would be yes. But today it's a total hypocrisy. We have people entering illegally. We don't, do not expel them. We do not regularize them. They work. And in fact, it's okay for everyone, but it is not living in dignity and it is also dangerous for the security. So if you want to make sure that French people can live in a security context, they all want that. We have to make sure that the process is legal and transparent, that we know who comes to Europe. When you distribute visas, you know who enters the territory. And 
I'm not saying that we have to, to, to um, take away the borders. As a state, we are entitled to have a migration policy. It doesn't mean that we're going to raise the borders. But at the same time, we have to do that uh, without being hypocritical. And uh, the leaders of the extreme right are hypocritical when they talk about migration zero. So it doesn't mean that uh, we are idealistic. We are, in fact, realistic, and we know that on the one hand, we have to respect international conventions that we've signed. We have committed ourselves to those principles as nations, and at the same time, we have to take into account the needs of Europe. So we get back uh, to the uh, mechanism and the majority at the EP. Major question regarding this election, a strong increase of the far right in the, the EP, uh, jeopardizing democracy and the conservatives and reformist of Europe, isn't it? But your argument somehow in face of uh, Valérie Ayer, you'd say, if you vote for me, I can be more significant, although sometimes you do not always vote with your own group. But do you think you are aware of that? How do you think this new team will play a role in the new parliament as it will be the crucible matter to apply and to implement new policies? Well, first, it depends on the people casting their vote. When you cast your vote, you are voting in order to signify to be a force into the institutions. Oh, wait, in the uh, parliament, the Social Democrat, will depend on the uh, result of the elections. And our, us, the France, it will depend on the result of the elections. If we show up with a major delegation next parliament, we will have a major weight within Social Democrats, which has a, a, a weight in the parliament. But as you know, we were six, six, which is good. Six European socialists, no, no, French, French socialists within the group. Of course, I know you, uh, you, you, you take away from uh, social democracy, but we were six French EP MPs. So with a bigger score, it will be better. With uh, six MPs, we uh, gave some uh, direction to the policy. As from this, it is a immense uh, chance. And uh, let's say five years ago, we were hesitating. When we started with Place Publique, we were at a crossroad of policy ecology and social democracy. So to join the social democrats, it was already a strong debate. And each day we were thinking that this was a very good choice. In that group, if you can bear a message, it is transformed into a directive, into a law, an act, a commission. So you got really a powerful leverage within the EU institutions, which is big. Never we would have uh, the uh, special commission about uh, foreign powers into um, our democracy. Never uh, we will have experienced that uh, uh, success to uh, bring messages at the European scale, whether it be the bank or uh, the taxes on the super profits, if it were not in that group, and the treaty on, about the energy charge. So into that group, and it's not always the case, you can manage to get a direct result on European policy. So we feel quite efficient, but with the, uh, the push of far right, it will be probably a small majority. Well, we are getting around to get to the or target. I've got that feeling, you know, that the uh, group of Mr. Bardella or Mrs. Ayer, it is uh, a marginal, or how to say, at the European Parliament, two big groups, the Conservatives and the Social Democrats. But the group Ayer is into the majority. Yes, well, you need a auxiliary group and you go to the marginal groups. The question is not to be put to me, it's to the uh, PPE. PPE, if you've got a push from far right, would you think that the PPE will remain pro-European or will decide to have a coalition with extreme right? We said as from the start within the group of SD, 
ID that is uh, Rassemblement National never, ECR, and that is never as well. ECR, it is the group with Meloni. Sorry to say so, there might be Marion Maréchal as well. It's not really the center right wing, no. What I mean is, in that case, if there is a coalition right, far right, there will be a strong opposition. So that means we have lost election. What we do hope is to win the elections and to oppose a progressive uh, power amongst the MPs. So there's no reason to be uh, into the far right. There will be a development of far right as everywhere in uh, according to the polls, but at the scale of the full continent, it's not as big as in France and Germany, but it remains important, yes, and they're in a position to uh, surpass, renew, and that is already an earthquake as the third power of the EP, but they're not in position to get the majority, no, but to have to tip over to the majority to the right wing. Lesson. It's the uh, moment of truth for the right wing. Sorry for that. At the EUEP level, Social Democrats, Renew and PP work together, it, isn't it? Yes, and on some, some texts. But can we kill that myth? There is a majority and a European government. In all recent texts, the majority, it was for all social texts, environmental texts, it was a radical uh, left until renew. It astonished a lot of French people because the ESUMI were voting with Macron. And it's true, it is compulsory to get a majority on environmental issues. It is uh, to unite uh, the uh, left and renew. But if it is about geopolitics, you got a coalition with the right wing and you don't take into account radical left-wing parties. So coalitions change at the EP. There is no majority. For each text, it is, there is a majority. You need to build that majority. And I know it is the light motive amongst certain left-wing parties to say there is a coalition at the European level. It is wrong. It is not true. There is a agenda, but for each text, the coalition is changing. It changes the vote on restoration of nature. You get a coalition, Insoumi, Green, Social Democrats, and Macron against the right wing and far right. That's the truth. And regarding other subjects like the defense of Europe, the coalition will be different. A last question, because uh, we urge to uh, close this session, so I don't get uh, additional time. You do support Nicolas Schmidt, Social Democrat, but concretely we know that there is an agreement, because you might not have the majority. You, would you be ready to vote for Ursula von der Leyen? I'd like to have Nicolas Schmidt as a chair of the EU Commission. I will repeat it a thousand times. First of all, I like Nicolas Schmidt. That's another scoop. No, this is politic, politics, and it's not voici. It's not a uh, uh, another paper. I like him politically because he defended fundamental text, minimum income, directive on the platform workers, and other social questions. So he is really motivated by the social democrat tradition. I do respect to fight for the rights of the workers. I want Nicolas Schmidt to put an end to 25 years of domination of PPE on the EU institutions. And I will do everything to do that. And I will send a maximum, I mean the elect, uh, the people voting at us, a maximum of MPs to that group to help Nicolas Schmidt at the uh, chair Men position. So you won't vote for Ursula von der Leyen. I'm voting for Nicola Schmidt on the commission. That's what I want. You didn't vote for her in 2019. No, I didn't. But uh, listen, sorry for that. It was a long time ago. But can we fact check? A fact checking. 
I don't think so, and I don't know. It was a secret vote. I don't think so, because I can uh, say it was so something was very good. Listen, as the start on the Green Deal, it is a social democrat agenda. So I would be in a very wrong position to tell that a whole balance is a catastrophe of Ursula, not at all. Similarly, a reaction on the 24th of February 22, as a chair of the commission and uh, on the head of the uh, general college, was much more valuable as a reaction as compared to the member states. This shows how much the federal institutions did uh, embrace the uh, interest of Europe. I do think that the domination of the right wing, uh, German right wing parties on the EU institutions has come to has to come to an end. There is a need of a change of direction, and so we need to fight them. They need to be fought. And today, Ursula von der Leyen will has a, have her last uh, State of the Union. It's a right wing position and it doesn't take responsibility of what has been done on the progressive point of view. So it doesn't take the Green Deal. She thinks that the ecology, it's the enemy of the competition, sovereignty and freedom. Everything I want to show is to reverse. Ecology can be defended. So she comes back on that as she is a uh, applicant of the right wing and the right wing is uh, of course uh, focusing upon ecological revolution. I want to reconcile ecology and the freedom. Everybody opposed these two principles. It's not true at all. My freedom against ecology, the truth is that the community and society is experiencing a decline. This decline and fatalism, mining our democracy is being anchored for the time being and we discover how much we dependent were dependent upon petrol monarchy far away until our day by day life the ecologic and energy revolution it is the momentum to discover our freedom and to decide by ourselves without depending on others that is the message to be carried across all that policy of von der Leyen, it is a position to get back to our dependency. We need to show how much ecology will allow to build our sovereignty, our liberty and freedom, and the autonomy of the EU continent. So, Nicola Schmidt, Chair of the EU Commission, we will see on uh, June the 9th. Thank you, Raphael Glucksmann. There were many questions we didn't have time to ask. They are mingled into our uh, discussion. Many questions on the tech as well. There are some people who will be able to talk about that. Anyway, we have got food for thought. Thank you very much to the audience online and here in this room. We will be happy to listen to your comments. You can address your reaction to live uh, at EU. Just a short word on that question over there. What did you do as a councillor, as advisor? I wanted to alert Europe on the risk of um, uh, Europe, of Vladimir Putin and the war against Georgia and Ukraine. I'm very proud because at that point in time, the uh, European elite went to dance in uh, Moscow, while it was dismantling Georgia, who wanted to be a member of the European family and wanted to uh, push its democratic revolution. I was opposed to that threat, which is Vladimir Putin. I'm very proud to help the Georgians to resist Putin and to make progress in the European integration. And I think that this continuity explains as well the campaign that we are heading for. Thank you, Raphael Dexman. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. We are united in diversity. We are very um, heterogeneous in our opinion. If we do not renew our partnerships with the rest of the world, 
Europe will not be relevant. We can make it if we are together as Europeans. Do you genuinely believe that countries will manage to reach these uh, very ambitious targets?